a mass spring system can be modeled as a second order initial value problem with constant coefficients. You have seen this before. If we now add a delta function on the right hand side, we can regard this delta function as a force of a very short duration. This force delivers a unit impulse on the mass. From a physical viewpoint, you might have an idea what happens to a mass and how our solution is going to look like. So what do you think? Now, let us solve the initial value problem and see whether your intuition is correct. So here we have our initial value problem. Uh, y double plus 2y prime plus 2y equals, now with a delta peak, administer that d equals pi and some initial conditions. So starting at 1 with unit starting velocity. So how do we solve that? Take Laplace transforms on both sides. Now, Laplace transform on the right hand side is the Laplace transform of the delta function. Plug in the delta function. We know what to do. So what did the delta function do? Uh, it puts t equals pi everywhere and eats the integral. So you get an e to the power minus pi s. I'm putting the pi over here at the spot where the t was. So delta functions are always very nice inside integrals. Now, what about the Laplace transform of the other side? Well, that is standard. Uh, you have the Laplace transform of y double plus 2 times the Laplace transform of y prime plus 2 times the Laplace transform of y. And then collecting a few terms, we have a s squared plus 2s plus 2 times capital Y. From here we get y0 equals 1, so we get a minus s, y prime of 0 equals 1, so we get a minus 1. And here we have y of 0 is still 1, so we get a minus 2. So that's what we have over here. And it is equal, of course, to the Laplace transform of the right hand side equals e to the power minus pi s. So then if we now solve for y of f, we get here, of course, we, if we bring it to the other side, we get an s plus 3 divided by this s squared plus 2s plus 2. And we have an e to the power minus pi s divided by s squared plus 2s plus 2. So far, so good. There we have our y of s, but we want to have y of t. So we need to transform back. Uh, we rewrite our right hand side as 3 g's. Why? Because it will become nice in the next step. The first is, uh, first we split up this part into two uh, capital G's, an S plus one divided by S plus one squared plus one, and uh, two times for the remainder, uh, two divided by S plus one squared plus one. Because this means that we have re rewritten our G one of S as the capital F one of s plus 1, where capital F1 plus s is just s over s squared plus 1. And this one is in our table. And our g2 of s equals 2 times f2 of s plus 1, where f2 of s equals 1 over s squared plus 1. And the 1 over s squared plus 1 is also in our table. And the remaining term equals e to the power minus pi s times 1 over s squared plus 1, sorry, times 1 over s plus 1 squared plus 1 which is exactly e to the power minus pi s times f2 of s plus 1. So we have a g1, g2, and g3, and we can transform them back, all three of them. Because the uh, capital uh, f, uh, f1 of uh, s can be transformed back to a cosine of t, so g1 of t equals e to the power minus t times the cosine of t, there we go. The f2 of s can be transformed back to a a sine of t. So this gives us uh, the g2 of t gives us a 2 because of this 2 times uh, e to the power minus t because of the s plus 1 times the back transform of capital F2 which is a sine. So we give it uh, 2 times e to the power minus t times the sine of t. And for the other one you have this e to the power minus pi s which means that we have to uh, start later, we have u pi of t and replace t by t minus pi in our uh, 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 inverted function. And if we invert uh, capital F2, we have seen what we, we got, we get an e to the power minus t times sine t. So we have an e to the power minus 
T minus pi, and we have to plug in T minus pi on the place of uh, the sign. So you get the u pi e to the power minus t minus pi and a sine of t minus pi. And of course, if you want, you can simplify sine t minus pi equals sine t cosine pi, not something with a cos and a sine if you want, but you can also leave it as it is. And the back transform is the sum of g1, g2, and g3. Now, was your intuition correct? Let's see how the solution looked like. Well, the g1 and the g2 are cosines which are damped. So what's happening is that uh, you start with some combination of sines and cosine which is damped away quickly uh, due to the friction by this e to the power minus t. And then what does this g3 do? Then at t equals pi something happens, the u pi becomes 1, you get a, a next wave starting uh, at, uh, at t equals pi which is then also damped. So what's happening? You get uh, you start with some waves which uh, uh, which which are damped, and then at t equals pi you give an impulse, and you get a next wave starting, which is then also damped away. So hopefully this is what you your physical intuition also told you. Uh, if not, of course we have the mathematics, and you, you can just do all the computations and see what comes out.